to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ there are many members yet but one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. Welcome to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Beginning in chapter 11 all the way through chapter 14, Paul is now going to deal with some abuses and the proper uses of things in the assembly and in worship to God. He's going to deal with the Lord's Supper and he's going to deal with miracles in this subject. He begins in chapter 11 by stating in verse 1 he wants Christians to imitate him as he also imitates Christ. And so Paul sets forth these principles based not on his own authority, but as he imitates and follows the teaching of Jesus. Now as we deal with items related to worship, one of the first things Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians 11 is honoring the proper role of men and women and Christ in the assembly. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. Here's the hierarchy God has set up. But I want you to know, Paul says, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And so imagine in your mind the divine hierarchy, the way God has established things to be. We have God as the head, Christ under Him, man under Christ, and woman under man. That's the hierarchy, the system God has set up in the church for authority. God is in complete control as the author of mankind. He's our creator, Genesis 1 verse 1. But God has put His Son in a place of having authority over the church, Matthew 28 verse 18, and over all men as well, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 21 through 23. Now Christ has established man to have authority in the home and in the church. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 through 31 we know that that man is the head of the home. That doesn't mean he's a dictator. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, so man must love the home and the wife and the children and do what's best for them. Now under man then we have woman as well. It's also noteworthy that in the assembly, especially what we're dealing with in the context, in the assembly Christ has all authority on matters of doctrine. Man is under Christ and must follow his teaching and woman is under man in a place of authority. This is seen in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 where Paul said it's not proper for a woman to speak or be a teacher over a man or be in a place of authority but rather to be in submission. Paul repeats this sentiment in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33 when he says that, that women are not allowed to speak in the church in the assembly they are to remain silent and so God has set men up in places of authority and women have not been given that by God. That's a, a way God has set things up. And so to understand worship, we've got to understand the authority God has set in place for worship. We've got to worship God in spirit and truth, John 4 verse 24, and we must be willing to honor what God has established in places of authority. Now one of the things Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians 11 Right following verse 3 is the authority of women not, not, not bearing authority over men. And he deals with this through the head coverings, having a symbol on their head, showing they are in a place of submission. Women today do that as well by showing that they are not ones to stand up, one to speak. They take a submissive role. Men are the leaders and thus Paul shows there is a hierarchy, a breakdown to that. Now in verse 20 following, Paul is now going to deal with the Lord's Supper and how it relates to worship. Notice 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20. Paul says this, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, here was an abuse these Christians had of the Lord's Supper. God has set up the Lord's Supper that when we take that, we all, 
come together in one place to partake of that. There is no division. There's not a separate assembly. We're all there together. Now, this is the way Jesus set it up in Matthew 26. All the apostles and he were gathered together and they took at the same time as it was being instituted. Now, friends, this is very important because they were abusing this. We learn in the context that one person was eating ahead of another. One had already partaken of it. Another had not yet. And so there was great confusion and discord concerning the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, when you come together, it's not to do this. But from that we learn we must all come together in one place. And one of the essential elements is to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, friends, there are some very important teachings here to learn, and that is that we must not divide the assembly. Some people today think it is acceptable to take the children and take them to one part of the assembly during worship, during the worship hour, and that that's okay with God. If Paul said, you've got to come together in one place, he's going to say that again in chapter 13 and 14, then when we worship, God does not intend for us to divide the assembly. There is no authority for doing that, and it is against the clear principles of 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. And so children's church, children's Bible hour, you don't find authority for that in scriptures, and it doesn't meet the burden that Paul places on, on the church here in verse 20. Now, as he deals with the Lord's Supper, there are some very important things he reminds them of. First of all, he reminds them that this is to be a very reverent act. Notice chapter 11 verses 20 through 22. Paul says in chapter 11 verse 20, Therefore when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One's hungry and others drunk. He said, What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Here they were treating the Lord's Supper very irreverently. One was come, he's already drunk, he's full with the Lord's Supper, another's not yet. They're not waiting on one another. And Paul says, if you want to eat a common meal, you've got houses for that. The Lord's Supper is not a common meal. Don't make it that. You all come together in one place. Now that's the context here. But friends, we see that it's reverent in the very purpose of it. It was a central part of their coming together. And friend, how important it is that we remain reverent in worship, that we honor God for who He is, that we worship Him according to spirit and truth, John 14, verse 24, and that we come together to pay honor to what Jesus has done for us. Imagine the chaos this must have been in the first century, all these people coming at different times. And so we learn that it is a very reverent act. Now here are some practical lessons that relate to that. When it comes to worship and the Lord's Supper, we need to make sure that we respect this as a very important action and a way to remember Jesus' death. That means that we ought not to be making light of that. Talking, laughing, writing notes, playing or daydreaming, things like that. My friends, they would be just as much condemned as making chaos at the Lord's Supper by not waiting on one another. So it is a, a reverent act which we need to do with the utmost respect for God. But notice also Paul sets out the requirements for this act in verses 23 through 25. Notice what he says here. Concerning the Lord's Supper, Paul says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this cup, and Paul says, Eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Here Paul sets forth some principles that we need to be reminded of. We are in principle to do things the way God has set up. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 tells us we're not to go beyond what's written. We don't add to or take away from the Word of God lest he rebuke us, Proverbs 30 verse 6, and we be, found, we be found a liar. And there has always been the strong command and warning found in example and scripture of those who perished because they did not do things exactly like God said. Be reminded of the example of Nadab and Abihu. Two young priests, they went to offer sacrifice to God. They used a strange fire, unauthorized fire, which the Lord had not commanded them. 
and fire came down from heaven and destroyed them. What a small thing someone would say. Well, what does it matter how you like the fire? They still worship God. No, they didn't do it the way God said that they should. And so we must remember that in principle, we must always do things like God has set forth. But also in the practice, we must use the elements that Jesus instituted, the bread represents the body of Jesus which was broken for us. The cup of the new, new covenant, the, the fruit of the vine, represents the blood. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant, speaking of the fruit of the vine which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so when we, when we meet together, we've got to realize there is a certain way to partake of the Lord's Supper correctly. We need to remember the death of Jesus. Jesus said, you need to do this in remembrance of me. I need to stop and think about all that Jesus did, what he suffered, how he was beaten, how he's laughed, laughed at, how he's mocked, how people uh, treated him in ungodly ways, and he did all that so that I could have the hope of one day going to heaven. But as we deal with the Lord's Supper, Paul also touches on the regularity of the Lord's Supper also. Look in verse 26 at what Paul says here. Concerning the Lord's Supper, Paul says this, As often, notice that, as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We learn two elements about the timing, the regularity of the Lord's Supper. It is going to last until the second coming of the Lord. The Lord's Supper was instituted for the church to last until He comes again, until Jesus comes in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 following. But we also notice that there is an oftenness to the Lord's Supper. Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Friends, so many people are confused about when Christians are to partake of the Lord's Supper. In the popular religious world today, many people say, well, it's good to do it on Christmas or Easter. Or some people say, well, we can do it once a month. Has the Bible told us when we are to partake of the Lord's Supper? It sure has. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the Bible says they came together, Christians came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, how many weeks have a first day? Why, every week has a first day. This is identical language almost to the command found in Exodus 20, verse 8. God said to the people of Israel, You remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Well, how many weeks had a Sabbath? Every week had a Sabbath. Did God say, Every week I want you to do this? Not in that immediate context. He didn't. Later He did in Exodus 23. But they interpreted that to mean every Sabbath that comes around, we're to remember it. God has taught us as well on the first day of the week, every week has a first day, we're to remember the Lord's death. Now, how do we know it's to be every first day of the week? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. In the original text, the word is, when we come together to give, it is to be on every first day of the week. Now, how many places do you know that don't understand every Sunday? Every time we gather for worship on the first day of the week, we are to the collection plate and give to God. Well, everybody recognizes that. Same language used in 1 Corinthians 16, also in Acts 20, verse 7. In the first century, they did this every first day of the week. Acts 2, verse 40, 42, they came together again to break bread. We should do that as well until the Lord comes if we're going to please God. Now, what else does Paul teach us about the Lord's Supper? Well, he teaches us that we're to do it in remembrance of Jesus and that it's something that we must, we must reflect upon how we do it to make sure that we're doing it in a proper way. I want you to notice verses 27 through 29 of our text. Paul says this, Therefore, Whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now in the context, the unworthy manner dealt with in verse 20 was they were not waiting on one another. They were not meeting the, the standard the Lord had set up. And today when we take it in an unworthy manner, when we don't use the proper elements, when we don't do it on the proper day, when we don't do it in the right way, when our heart's not where it ought to be, when we make abuses of it, we're no different than these people are. And so I need to reflect on the manner to make sure that I'm doing it the way God has set up. I also need to reflect upon myself to make sure that 
I'm doing it the proper manner by remembering the Lord's death and how I need to reflect on the Savior's broken body and all that He did for me on the cross of Calvary. And so 1 Corinthians 11 has a great deal of teaching concerning the Lord's Supper, but now also connected with the assembly, Paul is going to discuss the miraculous. In the section of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul has much to say about the miraculous gifts. Chapter 12, he's going to identify they've been given for the profit of all. Verse 7, to encourage, to edify, to uplift the body. Now, just because one person has one gift and one another doesn't mean they're better in God's eyes. Each member is important to the body, Paul will say. In chapter 13, he's going to show, though, that there is something greater than some miraculous gift, whether it be tongue speaking or prophesying. The greatest gift is love. Now, in this same chapter, Paul is going to show that miracles were not intended to last forever. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul will say, that miraculous knowledge, prophesying, tongue speaking, that would last until that which is perfect or complete had come. We know Jesus has already come. His coming again is not being spoken of. Rather, what is that perfect or complete that was going to come at which point the miraculous would end? We turn to James 1 verse 25 and we learn verses 22 through 25 that the Bible, God's complete and final will, the New Testament is that perfect complete law of liberty. And so miracles were intended to last until God had completed the New Testament, until we had everything we need so that we could know God's will. Someone says, well, that doesn't seem right. Miracles, they're for human gratification, aren't they? No, miracles were never intended that way. Do you know what the Bible purpose of miracles was? Mark 16, verse 20, and Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4 teach us that miracles were to confirm. God's Word. Let's say you have two people stand up. Both says, I'm a spokesman of God. In the first century, I'm a spokesman of God. You don't have a Bible to check. Check what they're saying. They both claim to be from God. Well, how do you know which one's right? Well, this man can raise the dead and heal the lame. And this man can't do any of that. That's God's sign of approval upon this person that his words are from God. Now today, we can check and know where to test the spirits. We can do that by getting out our Bible and seeing we have the confirmed Word today. Chapter 14 then is going to show us that in the first century, these people had different gifts. Some had tongue speaking, some had the gift of healing, some had prophecy. But these gifts were not gifts that just sent you into a frenzy and you couldn't control yourself. Rather, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 will say, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. If someone received a, a prophecy, someone received a psalm, someone received some gift, they could control that. It did not overtake them and force them to do anything as you see so much of today on television. Now, what do we learn about miracles in chapter 12? First of all, God does not want us to be ignorant about this subject. Notice chapter 12, verse 1. Paul teaches Christians this. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Implied from this is there was ignorance about the subject in the first century and oh how there is mass ignorance and confusion on the subject of miracles today. You've got people who claim they can do what Jesus and the apostles did in the first century. Only one problem with that. The giving, the laying on of the apostles' hands, that's what gave the gifts in the first century. Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 24. Well, what happened when the last apostle died? If the gifts were passed on by the laying on of the apostles' hands when the last apostle died, those gifts ended. And so there's so much confusion on this subject. But it's not God's fault. He's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and chapter 7 teaches. Rather, he wants us to do things orderly and in a structured way. That's why we have the Bible. Ephesians 5 verse 17, we're not to be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. John chapter 8 verse 32, we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. Well, what are some teachings Paul wants them and us to know about miracles? First of all, no one can have the Spirit of God if they don't claim Jesus as Lord. This is taught in verses 2 and 3. Someone says, well, Jesus is not Lord. You can know one thing. <laughs> they don't have the ability to do miracles. They're not from God. Well, that same principle is true. If someone doesn't claim Jesus as Lord in their teaching today, 
We can also know they're not from God because the Bible says that He is. 1 Corinthians 12 and verses 4 through 6 teaches us there were many gifts, prophets, teachers, apostles, the gift of healing, the gift of helps and ministering. There were various gifts, but only one Spirit gave those, the Spirit of God. And notice he says in verse 7, this is very important, these gifts were not given for one person alone. The gifts were given to profit everybody in the church. Look at verse 7. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. You know, many times when you see people who claim to do miracles today, why them and the person receiving that supposed miracle are the only ones who profit from that. Such was not the case in the first century. When miracles were done, when prophecy, when tongues, when they were interpreted correctly, everybody was edified from that. And thus it was for the building up of the whole body. Now in dealing with this subject, Paul realizes, the Holy Spirit realizes that there were gifts that are of greater value in some ways, gifts that were looked up to more by people. Just because one person had that gift and you didn't have that gift, that does not mean that you're not just as important to God as that person. So in chapter 12, around verse 14 following, Paul is going to deal with how, yes, there are many members. Each member does not have the same gift, but we're all important to God. Now in this section, we learn some very important truths about the church and what it is. The church is one body but it has many members. What is the church? You know, when, when I say to you, uh, we're going to go to church, is that correct? If someone says, well, I go to church at such and such place, is that correct? What is the church? Is the church the building? Is the church located on a map somewhere? No. Look in 1 Corinthians 12, and I want you to notice what Paul says in verse 12. Paul says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many, are one, so also is Christ. What is the church, the body? It's the members. The church is not a building. It's not stained glass windows. It's not an ornate design out of the medieval period. The church is the members. Christians make up the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, Paul would say, you individually are members. You are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. Now, how is it then that we get into the body? If the body is the members, the church is not the building, how do, we, how do we get into the body of Christ? How do we get into that saved group, the called out group? Well, Paul tells us in verse 13, here's a very important truth we learn about baptism. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and notice what Paul says in verse 13. Concerning these teachings on the body, Paul says this, For by one Spirit... We are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. By one spirit, by the teaching of the Holy Spirit given to the apostles, written down in the Bible, which we have today, we learn we're all baptized into the one body. Now, why is it important to be in the body? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 26 says, Jesus is coming back for those in the body, in the kingdom, in the church. Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. Well, if Jesus is coming back for the kingdom and it's essential to be received up with Him, I must be in that group. How do I get in it? Look again at verse 13. We're baptized into the body. Galatians 3, verse 27 teaches us that we're baptized. We clothe ourselves in baptism. We're baptized into Christ, Christ's body, the church. And so it's essential here. You can see the essentiality not in just Acts 2, 38 and passages like Mark 16, 16, but baptism is essential to get you into the group of the saved. How could anyone say that baptism is just an outward sign of an inward grace when you can't get in the Lord's body? without first being baptized, and my friends, that is very important. And so Paul deals with the idea that every member is useful, that we need not look down on lesser parts, what we think of as lesser parts of the body, and he shows us concerning this body. Now, we've talked about how that the body is many members, but I want you to notice another truth about the church in verse 20. Notice what Paul says. This is such an important truth that so many miss. Paul says, and it's a very simple statement, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body. How many bodies are there? If the body is the church, Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 says it is. If the body is the church, how many churches are there? How many bodies are there? 
Well, look again at verse 20. Paul says there are many members, yet but one body. Jesus only built one church. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I'll build my church. He built one church and it belongs to him. It's the church he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. And so, friends, we must, if we're going to honor God correctly, we've got to be a part of that one body. Now, here's what that means. Jesus didn't die for religious groups started by men. Jesus built his church. If it's his church, it needs to follow his authority. It needs to allow him to be the head of it, Matthew 28, 18, Ephesians 21, or Ephesians 1, 21 following, and it needs to bear his name. If something belongs to you, then that is yours. It is Christ's church, the church of Christ, because Jesus paid the ultimate price for the one body. My friends, we also learn an important truth about the church here in verse 25, and that is that God wants His church to be united. Notice what Paul says here in verse 25. Paul says that there should be no schisms, no divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. How we need unity today in God's one church. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133 and verse 1, their strength, their power, their sustenance can be gained in unity. And if we are the church, as verse 27 says, we need to be united in God's cause. And so I hope this lesson will help us to understand some very important teachings about worship, about how we're to worship God according to the Lord's Supper, and about miracles and their use in the first century. And next week, we're going to talk about chapters 13 and 14, how that miracles have come to an end, and we're going to notice how that modern miracle workers today are in stark contrast and in violation of what we find, and especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so as we think about this lesson, let's remember the greatest gift of all, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, is love. God so loved the world, He gave His Son for us. My friend, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you become a Christian? Do you love God enough to submit your will to will the Father? You can do that today by believing Jesus is God's Son, being willing to repent of those things in your life that are not right, be willing to confess His name before men, and do as Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sins. If you've not done that today, my friend, we're encouraging you, obey the gospel of Christ before it's eternally too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned he about all souls, and not your walk. Like we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our this lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's Christ lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville. And to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.